everyone for coming for tonight's lecture. Um, as a reminder, the lecture is going to be recorded. So if you don't want to appear on the recording, just make sure to keep your camera turned off. Otherwise, you're all good. Um, you've been muted upon entry just to help reduce feedback. Um, and if you have any questions during the presentation, there will be time for a Q&A at the end, usually about 10 to 15 minutes. You're also uh, welcome to write questions in the chat throughout if you would like. Um, but other than that, um, that's pretty much it. So John, if you're ready, feel free. <laughs> Yeah, I guess I'm uh, ready, about as ready as I can be. Um, yeah. So, uh, well, um, first off, uh, I'll go ahead and start pulling everything up. And while I'm pulling stuff up, I'll I'll say initial thank yous and such. But uh, um, I want to, uh, you know, start off by saying thank you to everybody for uh, joining me and letting me uh, present uh, to you um, about uh, some of the sustainable initiatives that the city of Raleigh, um, the city of Raleigh's horticultural department uh is um supports and how the greenhouse has been helping to implement uh some of these um so uh i guess i'll just go ahead and uh, start off by introducing myself um i am john emerson uh, i'm the greenhouse and nursery manager for the city of raleigh uh for the parks department um i've been there since july of 2022 um i have uh, five years of experience working in commercial agriculture uh, where I was a trial specialist working with watermelons, cantaloupes, and honeydews. Uh, that job involved uh, taking newly developed varieties out into uh, farm fields uh, where they were, were actually experiencing real life conditions. Um, because when the breeder was developing it, uh, those plants were being babied, they were being taken care of, everything, everything they could ever want. Uh, but not what was actually happening in the farm fields. Um, and so that job was a really cool job. I got to eat lots of really great fruit, uh, traveled a bunch. Um, and then right around the time that uh, Bayer bought Monsanto, uh, I found myself um, moving over to the University of California, Davis, uh, where I worked in the uh, lab of Dr. Richard Mitchellmore, uh, which is a lettuce research lab. Uh, we did lettuce gene discovery and breeding. Um, the breeding was for uh, disease resistance, and it was essentially uh, to breed uh, mother lines uh, that were provided to seed companies um, so they could actually have that disease resistance um, inferred in their lettuce. Um, I'm happy to say uh, four of the lines that I worked on uh, have been introduced this year or are being introduced in 2024. Um, which is pretty cool um and with watermelons they're all everything i worked on is already on the market um so i can't brag about that uh um my, i have a master's degree from the university of wisconsin in plant systematics uh which is rebuilding the evolutionary history of a plant family um uh, and including in that using geologic and environmental histories and, and things along those lines anything that could affect the history of the plant um is considered uh, i myself studied a really tiny herb that grows in the himalayan mountains of uh, western china and uh what i found was that they are hybridizing like crazy still um and i did not have a family tree but i had a mosaic uh, and um, it didn't go over that well, but I did get my master's degree, so that's important. Um, I also have a bachelor's degree uh, from the University of Tennessee in ecology and evolution with a concentration in plant biology. Uh, overall, I've worked in greenhouses for about 25 years, so I've, I, I've, I've lived basically most of my life in greenhouses, to be honest. Um, so a little bit about the city greenhouses. Uh, they were built over 30 years ago. Uh, renovated in 2011, uh, we have approximately 5,400 square feet under the, under roof in two houses. Uh, and overall, we do about 50,000 plants annually. Um, and of those, 25,000 are annual plants that are used to beautify the community centers, sign beds, um, and some landscaping beds in some of the parks uh, around the city. Um, of course, one of the first things that I always get whenever I get I meet people and they find out where I work, uh, they ask, "What are you, what are you talking about? A city greenhouse?" Um, yes, the Ra city the city of Raleigh was extremely uh, forward thinking 
um, 30 years ago to build a greenhouse. Um, we have people coming to us now that are, we have cities, pardon me, that are coming to us now that are asking for advice on how to build greenhouses for, for the cities. Um, uh, Greenville, South Carolina is a perfect example. Um, they just a couple months ago contacted us um, and met with the city horticulturalist uh, to discuss what it would take to build greenhouses. Um, the greenhouse, the city greenhouse uh, for Raleigh is the home base of our city's horticultural program. Uh, there we produce seedlings and propagations for significantly cheaper, obviously, than retail. Um, and one of the most important things is a lot of the stuff that we're producing is actually not available in retail. Um, some of it is rare. Uh, some of it's very, very difficult to get. Um, if it is, if you can get it, it is extremely expensive. Um, and so it's, uh, it's, yeah, overall, like I said, this is a very forward thinking idea that the city had 30 years ago. Um, and the fact that they've continued to maintain it is just, uh, I'm, I'm very impressed coming here from, uh, from another place. Uh, so this is what the city greenhouses look like. I, I, there was a small picture earlier. I decided I, I figured I would go ahead and put another one up so you got a better view. Um, there actually have been some uh, infrastructure improvements um, since I've been there, um, including uh, something that I'll discuss a little bit later with our cisterns that are towards the back. Um, but we've got we've included a few other pieces uh, uh, infrastructure that are very important um, to an overall greenhouse facility like this. Um, who do who do I work with? Um, so of course I work with uh, the Parks Department. Um, there's over 200 parks in the city of Raleigh. There's over 100 miles of greenways um, that I produce plants to help uh, fill spaces in both of those areas. Uh, we work with the community centers and community gardens that are now coming online. Um, I work very closely with the wildlife centers and nature nature preserves. Um, stormwater and stream bank restoration have been relying. Uh, very heavily on us this uh, this past season. Um, Urban Forestry actually uh, they help all of their plants uh, through me um, and uh, various city offices and then the city horticulturalist also himself works very uh, closely with the city planning department and a few of the other city offices as well. Um, so the greenhouse is just really we've got a huge impact um, while not being very you know not we're not a very loud area um, but we do seem to have a very uh, very large impact. Um, so when I'm discussing, when I, I'm switching gears a little bit after describing the greenhouses, let me tell you about essentially what we've been doing. Um, so uh, what I'm referring to sustainable practices, we all understand what that means, but I want to make sure to kind of define it. Um, this is from this is directly from uh, the United Nations World. I'm sorry, I want to make sure I get it correct. Uh, so I wrote it down, and of course, ah, the United Nations. World Commission on Environment and Development, um, and so they're you know they're they're specifically talking about um, not only the environment but also how uh, an intelligent way of moving forward in this world, um, and sustainability meets the needs of of what we're doing now without actually making it more difficult for the fu for future generations, um, and that's actually as a botanist that is just a wonderful goal. Um, I, that's that's something that I definitely. Uh, strongly want to achieve and I've wanted to achieve um, all my life, of course, I study plants. Um, part of that for me uh, is plant smart, capture carbon uh, and conserve water. Um, and capturing carbon, of course, I just do on a daily basis with my job. Um, but the, you know, one of the biggest things is planting smart. Um, and so to, to describe a few specific of the sustainable practices that we do at the greenhouse or with the greenhouse, um, when I'm referring to planting smart and capturing carbon, um, planting smart would be na na native and naturalized selections of plants themselves, uh, making sure that we're intelligent with our ecological restorations, um, being sure that our controlled removals are um, are ones that we are able to maintain that removal. Um, I'll describe a little bit more in detail what I mean. Um, seed saving is, of course, a really big term, um, but there's a there's some caveats to seed saving that it actually make it extremely important um, when it, when you're thinking about a sustainable practice. Um, and then, as I mentioned uh, earlier, I'm going to talk a little bit about the cisterns that we have at the greenhouse um, as well. Uh, so, with native selections, um, native and naturalized selections specifically, um, uh, I wanted to make sure that I spoke about the definitions that we use uh, when we're when we are using those terms. 
so a native species is something that has ori that originally evolved to fill a niche in a local ecology is how we're describing that. Naturalized is a uh, something that it, it has been introduced, um, but essentially it has developed within the within the ecology. It's something that uh, is not chasing out anything. It's filling. It's essentially filling a niche. It's filling in where where uh, there had there is a hole in that ecology. Um, an invasive species is essentially a plant which is generally behaving badly in the ecology. Um, one of the big things, though, about invasive is that there are in certain environments there are invasive natives. Um, so there are some plants that are native plants, which of course we want uh, that in certain environments become uncontrollable. Um, they start to behave badly in that ecology. And so within that ecology, that particular plant is an invasive, um, even though in other ecologies, it is something that we we covet as a native species. Um, so there is, you know, that's the, the reason why I'm saying I'm not saying that invasive is a non-native plant is because it's just a plant that's behaving badly in, in a certain ecology. Um, really cool that uh, in January of 2024, um, the state of North Carolina it, um, started to highlight the importance of planting native plants in uh, with transportation, new construction and renovated beds. Uh, specifically with state properties, um, the city of Raleigh is actually kind of taking that uh, that 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 as a signal that we also should be thinking about that. Um, and so we we have been told that we are leading the way. Um, we've got a few other uh, organizations that have actually consulted with us to see uh, how we're we're moving forward with this. Um, so this is actually really pretty great. Um, for the greenhouses ourselves in 2024, we're producing over 4,000. Uh, native perennials from seed. Um, that's, you know, we're not buying plugs with these things. These are all things that, um, that I, yeah, we're having to grow from seed, which is pretty spectacular. Um, 2,200 of them uh, have already been transplanted into what's going to be kind of their their permanent home until they go out into the, into the field. Um, most of these plants that we are growing from seed are extremely hard to find. And if you can find them, they are, as I mentioned earlier, extremely expensive. On the nursery in the nursery trade, um, and specifically this year, we we concentrated on wildlife positive plants. Um, we wanted to increase um, increase and diversify the pollinator visits uh, within our parks. Uh, we wanted to have these plants have a persistent structure, so that during the off season, there's still shelter that's available for for natural for na nature, uh, for the the rodents, for birds, for insects. Uh, for everything um and then also things that have that are uh, provide high nutrition high nutrition seeds uh for birds and other wildlife um to make sure that we are you know we're 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 considering we want future generations to see everything that we see um when it comes to plants and animals um and so this is this is one of the intelligent one of the best ways that we can do this um uh, when it comes to ecological restorations, um, re which is basically returning to the original, um, as an evolutionary botanist, I want I want there to be native plants everywhere. I want to spread native plants uh, everywhere that they're native. Um, but can, regretfully, as a modern botanist, I'm aware that our knowledge of what was native is not full. Uh, we are we have ideas of what may have been native in certain areas, but at the same time, we have also modified the environment significantly um, in cities and other areas where we're concentrating heavily uh, in urban environments, trying to shift our, our planting strategies. Um, so the best thing that we can do is to just be smart about what we're planting and be very patient. Um, a lot of the old environment has been scraped away. Um, and it's been replaced with other soils, with other environments um, and, you know, different lighting structures, different precipitation. It's just it, it's a wildly different environment than what what the plants that we want to return to a native uh, environment originally experienced. Um, so what we can do is we can plant according to our guesses. Sometimes the plants work and sometimes they don't. Um, but what we what we are able to do is we can we've been referring to historical documents um, trying to identify species um, several native species that we see have high restoration importance um, these are plants that um, 
that have been described in in lots of different documents as having very large populations, large swaths, um, things that that could we could potentially do controlled reintroductions in certain areas with high maintenance uh, to make sure that it's something that does not become a, a problem uh, as an experiment with the thought of being able to uh, increase the size of those introductions. Um, so that's essentially, you know, the way that we tackle the, the the issue of the environments not being there anymore is to try to find the right ones and then see about whether or not that plant can work there and behave in that environment, and then be then move that into an an, an, actual, an actual introduction, um, or probably reintroduction uh, in this particular case. Um, this is one of my favorite stories about the greenhouse, so I'm going to uh, brag a little bit about this. Um, so mid uh, last year, um, I got an email uh, from someone at Durant Nature Preserve that just said, will I come look at a plant? Um, as a botanist, as a scientist, that like immediately, you know, there was that little signal in my head that went, hey, this is you've got to follow this. This is the, nobody doesn't they don't just say this. Uh, so I pursued it. Um, I got to meet um, Acmella repens. Uh, it is uh, commonly known as spot flower. It is endangered in Wake County. It is only found in Durant Nature Preserve. Uh, the population is less than 100 plants. Um, it waxes and wanes in size depending on how the river and streams that are right next to it, whether or not there's a big washout. Um, the area that the population currently lives will be completely destroyed when the Durant uh, Dam is restored. So the reason why they contacted me is they would like for that, they would like to be able to return that plant to its its home. Uh, and so um, they, I went out, uh, located where it was, took 13 cuttings. Um, it is extremely successful with through vegetative propagation. I'm currently awaiting flowering um, just to kind of see how how what its pollination needs are, see if I have to do cross pollination or if it's a self pollinating plant. Um, I am actually familiar with growing a close relative of it uh, that is a self pollinating plant. So I'm kind of hopeful that it will be self pollinating so then I can have plenty of seeds and then we could either do uh, we can do a seed borne reintroduction. Uh, rather than a live plant reintroduction, which seedborne is preferred um, because then the plants that are established, once they establish there, um, they're fully used to the environment and they're already uh, they're already ready to flourish. Whereas when you're transplanting something into a new environment, it takes a minute for that new for that plant to get used to the new space. Um, so this is uh, it's not hugely pretty. I had to put the picture of the flower in there so you had at least something kind of pretty to look at, um, but this is one of them. Uh, inside this pot is the original like one inch cutting that I took. Um, and this pot is about uh, a foot across. Um, it is just completely filled that area. I'm doing very, it's very, very happy right now. It's doing extremely well. Um, I'm very excited at the possibility of um, of what we can do with this, um, especially when it comes to the, the bringing it back um, into that area. Um, of course, with the uh, when it comes to uh, nature conservation, one of the other flip the flip side of that is invasive management. Um, as I described, um, there are troublesome invasives that are native plants, um, but overall, the important thing is to have a controlled removal of the troublesome invasive. Um, we have guided a few of the departments and Greenway in helping them remove uh, particular uh, invasives that have characteristics uh, where if you shatter the plant, the plant will spread um, rather than, um, you know, you can't just cut it and leave something because it'll just, it'll it'll root and grow. Um, and so we, you know, we're making sure that they're, they're cleaning all the debris up, making sure that everything um, is removed. Um, but then one of the other th important things from our perspective is to make sure that when you're removing something from, uh, from the ecology that you're replacing you're putting something back that can fill that niche. Um, and so planting appropriately, uh, like I said, like I say, to to repair that ecological hole is extremely important afterwards um, because you would need something that not only can fill the ecological hole, but also grows fast enough to keep any potential other uh, invasives at bay. Um, 
we are working with uh, Greenways, uh, Natural Resources, and Stream Bank Restoration to identify key species um, that we can actually keep a population at the greenhouse um, specifically to be able to uh, do any rapid repairs um, uh, in, in invasive removal areas. Um, the, a few of those that have been quickly identified, or have been, that I can think of off the top of my head, pardon me, um, are uh, northern sea oats, buttonbush, and um, uh, red osier dogwood um, are three that we've been using. Um, and there's, the list is growing basically as I grow more and more plants from seed, we're identifying more and more plants that are important uh, to help us with uh, remedi remediating those areas. Um, speaking of remediating, um, that of course is would be removing the past from from an area. Um, and soil remediation um, for me is a plant-based alternative um, to importing soils uh, into an area. So one of the ways that we have dealt with uh, difficult soil areas or toxic soil areas is to scrape the soil off, remove it, put it somewhere else, and then bring new soil in. When you bring new soil in, you're changing the, the profile, you're changing the overall profile of your soil. Um, so you're actually changing what plants can go there. Um, and in doing that, um, you're, you're removing the possibility for some, uh, some re reintroductions or uh, restorations. So what I like to suggest is to use uh, different types of plants to actually remove those toxins. Um, and we're discovering more and more and more plants that are actually, that have these abilities to remove something from the soil while leaving the, the soil profile as intact as possible. Um, and uh, some of these actually present quite a pleasant display. Um, and then when it's, when it's the end of the season, you remove the plant, and when you remove the plant, you remove those toxins. A um, couple of examples, uh, Custoletskia pentacarpus, which is one of my favorites to, to suggest now, um, which is extremely good at removing salts and metals from soil. Um, that is the flowers that you see uh, here. The one on the, the pink on the top is true pentacarpus. The uh, one on the bottom is Custoletskia uh, pentacarpus virginicum. Um, so it's a variety that is actually more, from more northern, uh, more north of here. Um, obviously, white flowered instead of pink flowered. Um, they do also behave a little differently, uh, but uh, that's that's for another presentation. Um, Helianthus annuus, general sunflower, um, tolerates radiation, so it's actually able to uh, um, take radiation out of soils. Um, willows and poplar trees are known to to break down high amounts of compost. Um, in soil, which can be extremely dangerous for some plants, um, and uh, sergastum uh, nuttons, which is uh, a type of grass, also remove salts um, from soils as well. Um, those are just a couple of examples. Um, these are all ones that are actually at the greenhouse, um, which is why I put these examples in. Um, we have a few others, but uh, um, my research is growing uh, when it comes to soil remediating plants. Um, one of my personal favorite things to do is seed saving. So um, when it comes to uh, a, a sustainable practice that's really near and dear to my heart, it, it is seed saving. Um, and one of the reasons is because I had a professor that that uh, they the biggest lesson that they taught me when it comes to seed saving is uh, watch what the animals do. And then you will learn how to save your seeds. Um, and I thought that was kind of interesting because um, it was mostly referencing stratification, but it was also referencing kind of when the animals were going at the seeds too. Um, so essentially, one of the things to think about uh, with things like seed saving is um, for, for me, I suggest to people to initially teach yourself with vegetables, um, because one of the biggest things about that is you're, you need to leave something there specifically just to get seeds. Uh, so if you're growing tomatoes, you need to leave a tomato that goes bad on your on your vine. Um, it's hard, uh, but these are the types of things that you need to do. And this is uh, that's actually um, that's the reason why I suggest with with fruits and vegetables is because we're much more familiar with that 
But when it comes to um, a lot of the other uh, plants that I work with, um, I use those lessons in in my uh, seed my seed harvesting and my and my seed cleaning processes and my seed storing and stratification processes as well. Um, so uh, you know, as I say here. Um, that it, you know, we all know that seed saving is a very trendy topic amongst gardeners. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and, oh, actually, this is what I wanted to mention. Besides being free, this is the one of the biggest things about this, and this is the reason why seed saving is extremely important for these perennials that I'm growing. Um, besides being free, these seeds were developed in your environment. Um, so these seeds already have the knowledge of what it's like to grow in your backyard, uh, in the forest in North Carolina uh in 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 the park here um they already ex have experienced these in these environmental conditions they've experienced the winters they know what the soil is like uh the, all of this stuff is already part of of their knowledge before they germinate as a as a as a seedling and so if you save seeds from something that you've grown the next year those seeds are probably going to perform better than the mother plant um, and subsequently, year after year after year, as you get going, those plants are going to continuously perform better in your environment uh, as you save those seeds. And so that's also one of the reasons why it's very important is because some of these seeds that some of the perennials that we're getting seeds from, while they are ecotypes that are a North Carolina ecotype, um, the plants were the, the seeds were harvested in Pennsylvania or the seeds were harvested in Kentucky. Um, or the seeds were harvested in Western North Carolina. Um, and Raleigh is different than all of those. And so so we I want to make sure that we're preserving plants that and and seeds again for the next generation um, that they will be able to grow easily here. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, when it comes to seed saving, it's important to know when to harvest the fruit. Um, I have the uh, the okra here because you know we we, we eat okra way before the seeds um, are ready. Um, I'm sure that well, a lot of us are well aware of that. Um, but uh, if you were to uh, wait to harvest the fruit at the right time for seed collection, um, obviously you're going to wait until it's a big woody uh, cone instead of the, the delicious um, uh, green ones that we see in this picture. Um, knowing how to age or ferment the fruit, um, Essentially, one of the ways to think about that is if if this is a seed uh, that normally pa has a gut passage, um, as in, as in an organism will eat the seed before uh, the seed is is spread, um, then that's when you actually will ferment it. Um, aging it is uh, sunflowers and a few of the um, daisy family. Those seeds actually do have to essentially age uh, before they can be planted. Um, you know, uh, harvesting and cleaning the seeds. Cleaning the seeds is actually extremely important for some seeds, not as important for others. Um, it's It does help uh, when it comes for you to be able to know um, really how many seeds you are spreading. Um, because uh, with some plants, um, they, there's a lot of debris uh, when, if you don't clean the seeds properly. And so you end up with um, what you think is a much smaller germination rate. Um, experience. <clears throat> uh, and then seed stratification is actually, um, that's something that I played with a lot over this winter. Um, that is actually essentially giving a seed uh, its wake-up call. Um, and that includes a few different methods, um, including uh, I boiled some seeds. Um, uh, there were some seeds that I had to put outside for a couple weeks and then back inside and then outside again and then back inside. Um, I just had to play around quite a bit um, to be able to get those uh, to work um, and germinate. And I am uh, very happy with the results that I have so far. Um, last, uh, or not last, pardon me, but uh, the next thing that I would like to talk about, of course, is the cisterns um, that I mentioned. Uh, so in 2011, the cisterns were added to the greenhouses. Uh, when I started working, at the greenhouses in July of 2022. Um, we were walking around and I looked at the cisterns and asked, how do I get the water out of them? Because there was no way to get the water out of them. Um, so they had installed the cisterns, but had not installed um, anything else, any of the other parts of the infrastructure. So 
Uh, Neil, the city horticulturalist, and I applied for and received a uh, grant from Raleigh Rainwater Rewards uh, to update our cistern system. Um, and this morning, I uh, used rainwater in my greenhouses for the first time. Um, and actually, that's the first time since the greenhouses have been built uh, that we use rain rainwater. Um, we have a capacity of 2,400 gallons um, that we will be able to use uh, at any time. Um, the two tan cisterns that you see in the photo here are um, are the those are the original cisterns um, that have been there since 2011. And like I said, there was nothing attached to them. Uh, and then the black, uh, there are two black ones, um, and that shed in the middle uh, is our pump house. And so that's that's very that's actually a huge victory for us um, because we're going to we had been using Raleigh City water, um, and now we'll be able to use rainwater for the um, for all of our hand irrigation. Wanted to just get, show you guys a couple of photos of some plants that are flowering right now at the greenhouses um, because uh, um, they it it's early early spring, but um, still some stuff uh, showing some beauty. Um, the yarrow uh, that's in the bottom left has actually been flowering for a couple weeks now. Um, the bees have already found it, uh, which makes me very, very happy. Um, so, uh, Alex, I, I, I think I talked really, really fast. I, I'm, I'm sorry, because I only have this left. You're all good. <laughs> Thank I'm, you so much. I hope John. there are lots of questions. Oh yeah, definitely. All right, let's oh, um, right. open up to questions for sure. Thank you so much. Um, you're welcome to either type questions in the chat or unmute yourself and ask a question. Um, if you send a question in the chat, I'll read it out loud just so that we can capture it <laughs> for the recording. I have a question actually. Um, so I know you were talking about um, like how native um, species become, can become invasive? Is there like one that's like a particular concern like in this area that um, you know of? Um, to be honest, we've done a really good job of, of maintaining that in general. Um, there are a few spots that um, that Chasmanthium uh, northern sea oats um, has gotten to be a little troublesome um, where it's kind of jumped over some trails uh, and so it's it's it has the potential um, to really overpopulate areas that we want more ferns um, and so so it's something that uh, I've I've talked to the guys with Greenway about uh, trying to kind of get it back over on the river side rather than letting it encroach over on the other side of the, the, the paths. Mm -hmm. Okay. Maybe I have someone typing right now. <laughs> uh, I'm also, I'm always curious just to know like how people get into what they get into. So like what, what kind of made you like get uh, so interested in plants in the first place and want to pursue that? So that's, that's kind of a big question. I know. <laughs> well, so it's funny, it, it's kind of one of those things I, I had, um, I was in, I was in school and needed to, needed to figure out what I wanted to do and um, had the opportunity to take a moment of reflection. Um, uh, that's just a really nice way of saying I had been academically suspended for a semester. <laughs> <laughs> um, because I was not paying good attention in all my classes. And I thought, what class did I really like? What was the class that I really, really flourished in? And it was botany. And I thought, let me go and talk to some people. And uh, I, I actually had the opportunity to um, meet the professor who ended up making sure that I was able to, to build the degree that I built. Um, because when I returned back to school, the botany department had been dissolved. Um, so what I was originally wanting to do was gone. Um, and so I needed to, uh, find another, um, way of essentially achieving that. And, um, and I had a professor that I met while during these discussions who was like, here, 
I got you. And so I was able to, uh, my, my degree is a third uh, agriculture, a third research science, and then a, a third like kind of theoretical plant science too. Okay, so you almost kind of like made your own in a way. <laughs> yeah, I did. It was, it, it, he retired right afterwards. So uh, I think he was kind of like, that was his last hurrah. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's awesome that he was so supportive of. Uh, so that there was question. a question? Yeah. yeah. Uh, sorry about that. Um, what is your strategy to protect common milkweed from rabbits? Last year, my park lost its usual ample numbers to rabbits before the plants reached four feet tall. Or four inches. Sorry. Uh, it is a yeah. pollinator garden where no chemicals are used. Yeah, that's... Um, so I personally... Um, the strategy that I recommend to the gardeners uh, is to try to locate the milkweed as close to the center of a bed as possible. Um, and uh, that, yeah, oh man, rabbits, rabbits were really bad last year too. That's just a, uh, it's such a heartbreaking story. Um, yeah, that's we so we recommend that they try and place the milkweed as close to the center of the bed as possible. Um, some of the uh, pollinator plants that we've actually we're generating this year um, are they have a little bit of uh, like rattlesnake master has a little bit of spiky leaves um, that will help maybe help protect if it's on the edge or nearby. Um, but uh, it's a really it that if the rabbits and the deer are are hungry it's they're very difficult to stave off um yeah i wish i wish that there was a good solution um other than uh hoping that we can plant them far enough away or in an area that are isn't quite as attractive that was a really good question <laughs> <laughs> we have other questions One more. Um, how like um, I was trying to think out a word. This like how long did a plant have to exist in a space to like be considered native rather than like naturalized? Like, like is it like based on like how long it's been there or um, I, I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. No, that actually that does that does yes. So um. So essentially, from from our perspective, um, the easiest way to describe it, from our perspective, a native plant is is it's been ever present in that particular environment from our perspective. Um, so as far back as we can look, um, it's there. It's been there. Uh, naturalized is really, to be honest, it's really an occurrence that's been because of humans moving things around um and so uh a good probably the the top example of a naturalized plant is dandelions um they're globally naturalized they are literally everywhere um they don't hurt anything they kind of they don't really benefit either but it's it just it's kind of it's a plant that just is it's now ubiquitous like it's just kind of we we just we know it's there and it's it's essentially harmless. Um, whereas, yeah, na like I said, native is, is it's, it's ever present. And when we, when we look at that, at that, cause we're, we kind of take snapshots through history. And then if, and if every snapshot still has that, that plan in it, then we're good to go. Okay. Yeah. So basically just like not, didn't really involve like, human involvement to have to exist in space yeah yeah exactly. okay okay cool uh and then we have another follow-up question about milkweed um what is the best way to re-establish common milkweed and butterfly weed without chemicals um so when you say re what if you don't mind me asking um when you say re-establish um is it like letting it letting it come back is that what you mean by reestablish? Uh, 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they're typing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Play more um, and letting it come back. Yeah. So uh, I've I have found actually this is um, milkweed. It it's really it's it's so slow to come back. Like I don't know how else to de to describe it. I just I wish I wish it was faster to come back. Um, and so it's I I've had I really just only had been able to have patience um, when it comes to uh, having it come back and do well um, because because milkweed is one of those plants that doesn't really like to be taken care of. Um, I know it sounds funny to say, um, but it's it really, yeah, it's kind of, it's a plant that uh, prefers harsher environments. Um, and so, um, so because of that, when it's wet, when it, when, you know, springtime is around and everybody else is having a good time, milkweed is not really wanting to, to pop up. Um, and so it's, uh, like we're, we're seeing it with the perennial milkweeds that we have at the greenhouse. Nothing, nothing's up. They're all flat pots right now while everything else is popping up all over the place. Um, and you know, I really wish that there was a way I could coax it, um, to wake up earlier. Uh, it, yeah, I, um, it's just a, it's a, it is a difficult plant. Um, I, I admit as a botanist, I admit that. Mm -hmm. oh. uh, last call on questions before we wrap up. All right. Well, thank you again so much, uh, John, for yeah. presenting. Yeah.